Well, welcome back to Because We Believe. This is actually a continuation of what we started last week. We are in our Bible story room. You may be aware if you've been up here and taught any time. But this is the place where we tell Bible stories, and so it just seemed fitting. It's one of our indoor-outdoor places. So actually being inside, I'm outdoors. So just wanted to share some more things with you today. Uh, We started in Luke 4 last time and talked about a time when Jesus went back to his hometown. And in going back to his hometown, he was able to go to the synagogue and stand up and read, and he picked a passage out of Isaiah. And the passage out of Isaiah was that he would be the one who was coming. He would be the Messiah. He would be the one who relieved people from their suffering. And then he handed the scroll back and said, this passage is now being fulfilled in your hearing because he is the fulfillment of the passage that Isaiah wrote a thousand years before. And so it's one of those times where it was almost exciting to be able to be there and to, for, for a couple of reasons, because Jesus had come back home and everybody's proud of him. He's grown up, he's 30 now and everything's good, but also because of what's happening with God. And what Jesus is saying is this passage is now being fulfilled. What a great time to be able to realize when God is actually fulfilling scripture right exactly as it happens in your life. But Jesus doesn't leave it there. And he begins to press them, not just because they're saying, well, he's, that's a great lesson. Thank you so much. And you've got to kind of deal with all of those things of him saying, well, you know, that was a great lesson, but they're not getting the point. And the point isn't that we wanted Jesus to deliver a great lesson, but that he is trying to make people of faith. And so he begins to challenge them. And he says, maybe you'll say, physician, heal yourself. And then he tells them two Bible stories. And actually, actually, it's just a line from two Bible stories. The first one we looked at last week, it's about the widow Zarephath and how she would trust God and give up the very last thing that she has, the very last bit of food in order for her son and her to provide for Elijah, and then they would eat forever. And that is what happens because she is willing to give up the very last bit of food that they had. Today, we wanna talk about another story But let's read the part in Luke chapter 4 where Jesus describes this. And he just in one line gives you a scripture that shows here is why I think this is a person of faith. Let's look at that. Luke 4, verse 27. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed but only Naaman the Syrian. And when they heard all these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they could throw him down the cliff. And passing through their midst, he went away. Well, Jesus only has to tell one line of the story about Naaman. And he suggests that in the time when Naaman lived, there was only one person healed of leprosy. And it was not a person of Israel. In fact, it was a Syrian, a guy named Naaman, and that he was the only one who was healed, and he was somebody outside of Israel. And certainly all the Jews and the people of Israel thought they were the chosen people of God and that God only blessed them. But actually at that time, the people had been wicked, and so God was blessing Syria, and especially Naaman. Naaman had gone and captured a servant girl on one of the raids that he had from Israel. And as he had done this, he brought her back and gave her to his wife, and she became the slave girl of his wife. There are a couple of things in this about the faith that we see. First of all is the faith of the servant girl, that she has brought back, has been captured by someone else, and brought back and made into a slave. But even at that time, she is concerned about her master. Well, they already know the story. And they know how it ends. And the people become so upset at this, the fact that God would bless somebody else and not them. 
because they've been asking Jesus, won't you do some of the miracles that you've done in other places here? And he's saying, all you want is the miracles of God. I'm not sure you really believe in God for God and that you just seem to be wanting the miracles. They know the story. They understand the story. And they understand the accusation he's making. Actually, they become very, very angry and very upset at this. And so they decide they're not going to put up with this. And they've gone from saying, what a wonderful sermon, and being so proud of Jesus, to being a very angry crowd, because now they're being accused of not being faithful people of God and that God would not come and do works among them, and that God doesn't owe them special favor. And so they decide what to do with him, and they're ready to take Jesus. In fact, they do take him. They take him to the brow of the hill, it says, and there's a cliff, and they're ready to throw him off the cliff. They're going to kill him. Well, a couple of things about this, it, it, it seems very uh, difficult. First, I don't want to be a preacher in that town if they already know where the edge of the cliff is. And it seems as if everybody is okay with this. And it seems like they might have done this on another occasion and that there have been other people. And whenever they get too upset at someone, this is their solution because there isn't any dissenters or anybody to offer a different opinion. It just seems like, okay, well, we don't like what he's saying, and we feel very guilty, and we know how to solve our guilt, and we solve our guilt by murder. Not a good way to do that. And yet, as we look at what Jesus is doing, the odd part about this is he begins to walk back through the crowd. I don't know if he disappears or if suddenly he's just there and walks away and they don't know what to do with that. Um, it, it really is kind of a mystery in this passage as to how he goes away. But he walks out through the crowd and he goes on his way and they are left with their own guilt and the realization that maybe they aren't faithful people. And so what does it mean to be faithful? Let's look at this passage and look at the story of Naaman and figure out what Jesus is trying to tell them as he talks about what it means to be a faithful person and to be a person who has such great faith that God would bless them. The passage is in 2 Kings 5. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Syria, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, Would that my Lord were with the prophet who was in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord, thus and so spoke the little girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, go now and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. And so Naaman is a commander of the army of Syria. And one of the things we learn from this passage is how Naaman listened. There is a servant girl that he's captured, brought back, and she serves his wife. She tells the wife about the prophet, the man of God, who is back in Samaria. And if he was there, he would be healed. So the first stage of faith would be the little girl who believes in the prophet of God and believes absolutely that this prophet of God would be able to heal Naaman. Tells the wife, the wife tells the husband, Naaman believes her goes to the king, asks the king, here's what the girl said. And the king says, well, go do it. Well, there's a whole lot of people who are listening to each other who believe this story. And it's kind of a fantastical story, isn't it? Would you believe if someone who is working for you says, I know the cure for the coronavirus? Well, there isn't a cure yet. Oh, yes, I know the cure. Would you go try it out? Would you go to the place and to the certain man who has the cure? 
Well, there was no cure for leprosy at this time. And so Naaman is very excited about this, goes to his king. The king gets permission or gives permission for Naaman to go and to be able to find this man and to be healed. He takes with him many things. He takes with him 10 talents of silver. Well, that's a great amount of money. A talent is about $10,760. It was the best price I could find. So he's looking at $107,000 he's carrying with him in silver. 6,000 shekels of gold. Price on gold varies a lot. It goes up and down every single day. And depending on whether you take it from their time or from our time or when the market was high or low, he's talking about between a half a million and up to maybe five or six million dollars in gold. And then 10 changes of clothes. It couldn't have been easy. They couldn't just go to the store and buy clothes. And so once you had a set of clothes that was extremely valuable, he goes and takes 10 changes of clothes. Now, why does he do all this? Is he trying to buy it? Possibly. Or maybe you're just trying to be gracious. And if he will heal you, you will give him a donation. Perhaps that's what he's thinking he's going to do. In any rate, he is prepared and he is expecting to pay something for the fact that he can be healed. And so he sets off and goes on his way. He has a letter from his king to the king of. Israel. Okay, wait a minute. Something's already off in this story because the king of Israel doesn't know anything about this, does he? And so as we look at the story, that further complicates things. 2 Kings 5, verses 6 and 7. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. Well, when the king gets the letter, he immediately feels threatened. I mean, what is he supposed to do? He, he questions, Am I God? Am I supposed to do this? And he, first of all, thinks about his own resources and about what he might be able to do or actually he's thinking about what he can't do. He knows he can't give life. He knows he can't cure leprosy. He knows that there isn't any one of his medical staff who's able to cure leprosy. But this gives us some insight into what we need to know about faith. The little girl who was captured, who now serves in Naaman's house, has more faith than the king of Israel. Why didn't the king of Israel just say, you know what, there's a prophet, and the prophet's name is Elisha. I don't have to deal with this. I can just send this along to Elisha, and I'm sure he will deal with this, and it won't be any problem at all, because certainly there's a man of God who is able to heal, and I don't have to. But that's not what he thinks, and so many times that's not how we approach it either we immediately feel threatened and we immediately begin to question our resources and what are we going to do? We don't first go to God or think of God or what God's able to accomplish. We first think, what resources do I have? What can I get? What can I do to fortify myself and to build up myself? For example, when we hear about coronavirus, what's the first thing we do? Well, first thing is go buy toilet paper. I still never have figured that one out. But we assume that somehow if we had better resources, if we had more paper, more food, more whatever, then we would be able to survive and we're looking in the wrong direction. Why didn't we first pray? Whether we are able to do anything or not, and we're not, God is always able to do something. And that's what faith is about. The little girl believes absolutely this man of God could heal leprosy. And so she has much greater faith than the king. The king is threatened. The king doesn't know what to do. The king feels like it's a trap. He's going to pick a fight with him. 
and he's going to say, you know, you couldn't do this. So maybe he'll come and capture him or he'll come to war with him. And it's also unnecessary. If we would just believe in God and know the resources God has given us, and maybe even know who the man of God is or where that place is where we can call upon God and he would answer, we would feel a whole lot better. James 5, verse 8. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me now, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. Well, Elisha hears about the king and about how he's torn his clothes and is in such great distress. He sends to the king and he says, why are you so upset? Why have you torn your clothes? Didn't you know there's a prophet in Israel? And so he offers to help and offers to take the problem off of his hands. And sure enough, the king of Israel is very glad and very excited to be able to send this problem right along to Elisha. And so Naaman is sent to Elisha. Well, Naaman has this huge entourage because after all, he's a commander. And after all, he's got all of this money carried with him and all of his possessions. And he is expecting something great. I mean, here is the one place in the world where he might could be healed. And so he comes to Elisha's door. I don't know what the door of your house looks like, whether it's very impressive or not. If somebody drove up to your door in a big parade and had all kinds of army with them, maybe doesn't drive up in chariots, maybe drives up in tanks, would it be impressive at your house? My door isn't that impressive. It's just a door and that's all it is. And so they come with all of this parade and they come up to his door and he's there, he's ready for the great prophet of God to come out and heal him. And so he's a little bit disappointed. Elisha doesn't even come out of the house. Elisha sends a servant, we'll learn later his name is Gehazi, and he sends him out to say, go dip in the Jordan seven times, and you will be clean. Okay, was that it? Is that the answer? Well, isn't that what you wanted? That is the answer. And yet so many times we're not really satisfied with the answer when it seems so simple. We wanted something much bigger. We wanted something greater. We wanted to feel something. We wanted the earth to shake a little bit, at least have Dolby sound or something that would say, God is at work here. And it's all just too simple. And so here we have Elisha not even coming out to him. But there's a servant who's there. And it's just too easy. And so what do we do when the spiritual answer is just too easy? And I think sometimes we run into this. God has made a very simple plan. It isn't big. It isn't flashy. It doesn't need a parade. It's a very simple plan about how to get to God. And yet sometimes today when we look at churches, what we see is people are making it a parade and making it big and flashy and lasers and smoke and all kinds of things that go around with camera angles and, and music and all kinds of, and that isn't God. Because God's answer was very, very simple. And so the faith is not in all the big fanfare of what needs to happen. The faith is either in God or it's not. And Naaman comes expecting the great fanfare because after all, this is a great God who could heal leprosy. And it is a great God who could heal leprosy. And he's going to do it in a very simple way. Second Kings 5 and verse 11. But Naaman was angry 
he went away saying, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? And he turned and went away in a rage. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And so Naaman was angry. He's very upset. He wanted the big fanfare and he didn't get it. And so he goes away angry. He's in a rage, it says. How could he treat me this way? His expectations were way up as if there's something great going to happen here. And he feels like what he got was something that was just very, very simple. I wonder how many times we're disappointed in God because it doesn't meet our expectations. And sometimes it might challenge our faith because we were expecting something great. We were looking for something great. And it was great, but it was too simple. It was too easy. It was a very simple answer. We wanted great emotion and, and great things to happen, and it, it just didn't meet our expectations. I think sometimes people are this way about church. They go to church, and it's like, it's got to be something great. I'm going to the house of God, the place where I can meet God. Uh, to the, and we get there, and it's just normal people. And they've got the same problems we've got. And they don't seem any more spiritual than anybody else. And some of them might be, but some of them are just normal people. And we begin to question then about whether or not we're in the right place. And so we go looking for a better experience, right? Something that feels better, something that fits me more. I don't know how many times I've heard people who are changing churches who are looking for something else that fits them not sure God is in the business of fitting us. I think we're searching for God. And the person who's faithful is going to take the answer of God and what God said. And it may be very, very simple. It may not meet our higher expectations. But if you'll do it, it is 100% effective. And it's then that we see the result of faith. It's then that we see the great miracle. And so Naaman is not going to wash in any Jordan River. I don't know if it's muddy. I don't know why it looks so bad. He names two other rivers in Damascus that are much better than that river. And he's maybe it's a little bit of national pride or something like that. But he's also got servants with him who are able to ask him the question, And just like at the beginning, a man of faith listens. And so Naaman listens to them. Didn't he say that if you would dip in the Jordan, you would be healed? Yeah, he said that. Then wouldn't you try it? And he stops the chariot and he tries it. He goes down into the Jordan River. I don't know if they picked a a beautiful spot or what, but whatever place he picks, he goes down into the Jordan River and he dips seven times, just like the prophet of God had said, and he comes up clean. Well, he is so excited about this. That's what he wanted all along. That it, it, it was such a simple thing, but it it worked and it worked immediately, and it was everything that God wanted, and it was everything that Naaman wanted. And so as you see how this happens, you see a Naaman able to come up and come back to Elisha. And he is so excited about the things that Elisha has done for him. And so he comes back to the man of God. And he says, I know that there is no other God but in Israel, and I will never worship another God. And he says, I want two mule loads of dirt so that I can take it back so that I would stand 
on dirt from Israel. And he says, I want forgiveness also. Because when the king goes into his temple, he leans on my arm. And I would have to take him into that temple. I want you to know I do not believe in that God and I am not worshiping that God. And Elisha forgives him. He says, we will completely understand that and and it will not be a sin that's against you because we already know that you believe. And of course he believes now. Of course he understands because of all these things. He tries to offer him the goods that he has and says, well, I'm willing to give you all of this. And Elisha simply says, no, I don't want it. He says, well, at least take some of it. And he says, no, I don't want it. I'm not going to take any of it. Well, okay. And so he leaves and starts away. And the end of the story is a little bit sad because the servant of Elisha runs after him. Once he sees Elisha's gone back in the house, there's a chance for riches getting away. He runs after him and he stops the chariots and he gets down. He says, what is it? And he lies. He says, there's two men who have come and perhaps you could give a talent of silver and a change of clothes. Well, he gives him two talents of silver and two changes of clothes and people to carry him back. And he carries them back and he puts them in his own tent. Elisha, being the man of God, already sees and already knows all of this. And so when Gehazi comes into him, he says, where have you been? Nowhere. What have you been doing? Nothing. Is that conversation familiar? He says, I already know what you have done. And I want you to realize that the leprosy that was on Naaman before will now be on you and all of your descendants as long as they live. And so while Naaman was healed because he believed in God and believed in the man of God, the servant is not healed because he does not follow what God said or what God wanted. He thinks about himself and his own resources and about what he could get and about how important it would be. And this is such a great opportunity. Well, it was an opportunity for faith. And that's not at all what happens. And so what can we learn about this story? Well, as Jesus refers to the story of Naaman, What he's talking about is here's a man who believed in God and believed what God could do when nobody else was being healed. There weren't any other people. In fact, you would say it's impossible because it hasn't been happening. And yet he believed in a servant girl who believed in the man of God. And that's all it takes because he is willing to go and willing to be there and he believes it can happen. And certainly it does. But also we learn that it happens in very simple ways. That it happens simply by going to the place where he said, dipping in the river that he said, the number of times that he said, and he's healed. No big fanfare, no big parade, no big things happening. And it seems like it's very much aware and very much a part of what we would do today. Church is not usually impressive. I mean, the people who stand up and speak, they're not impressive people. They're not great entertainers. And yet, hopefully, they have the message of God. And it is in the power of God where our faith is to rest. And so it's not in the church that has the great fanfare. And sometimes you can see churches like that. That's not what faith is about. And Jesus says, Naaman is a guy who is healed when... Nobody else was because Naaman believed and listened and did what the prophet said. Now, you also know with this story that he was a little bit angry at times and he didn't believe sometimes and he questioned sometimes. And certainly that's okay. That's also what the story tells us. But it's also the fact 
that Naaman was able to do what God said. He listened to somebody else. He listened when he was off track. And so many times I think that's what's important is that we would listen to someone who would tell us where God is and how to find God. And that we would actually go and that we would find God. It seems such a simple thing like church, it's normal people. It's a simple thing like baptism. Being dipped in water and brought up is the symbolic of dying to ourselves and being buried in water and being raised to a new life in Christ. And certainly scripture bears out all of that. And if we believe that's what happened and believe in Jesus who died on a cross and as we are buried in this water of baptism, the same way Jesus was as an example for us and raised to walk a new life for the forgiveness of our sins and to receive the Holy Spirit exactly as what was done on Pentecost with Peter, then we are able to have that as well. And it's such a simple thing for us. And yet it is what happens. It is what draws us close to God. Communion may be one of those times it doesn't seem like it's very impressive at all. There's a person up and he reads the same scripture or says the same words and we're paying more attention to the baby right in front of us or to the one that's screaming down the row. And yet in that simple thing, God has said, that's where I communicate with you. Jesus gave that supper the last night before he died. It's what communicates with God. And if we will be serious about that, and if we will take that time and take that simple thing that he has given us, that's really where we link with God. And it is in all of those simple things that we find great faith and great spiritual enrichment in God. And I hope that's what you're finding now. We can panic about viruses and we can panic about disasters and we can talk about all the things. And really our panic is because we're afraid we don't have resources. God has lots of resources. And if we believe in God, then we're going to be sure that he's able to do whatever it takes for his people. I don't think Elisha worried about who the king thought was important. He didn't try to make himself popular. People in Israel knew he was a man of God, and yet all the people went the other way. But when you look at it, if anyone was really searching for God, they were able to find him because Elisha was there as a man of God. So are you searching for God, and have you found him? He's right there. If you can just listen to people around you, I'm sure that we're able to find him and able to grow in him and able to have this great faith that Jesus was expecting of people in his hometown. We may not be the people of his hometown, but certainly Jesus would be excited to be in a place where we worship with him.